It was um, my apologies again for, for the mistake on the time. So, thanks for, for everybody being here. So, this is really a pleasure to introduce uh, Rafael Pereira here. So, it's one of those serendipitous situations, right, that uh, we seem to work more or less uh, on similar things, but uh, we had to meet uh, through an uh, undergraduate student that we, we are trying to co supervise. Uh, and was with uh, Hugo as well, Davi. So Rafael is a transport uh, geographer whose research looks broadly in how urban and transport policies shape the spatial organization of cities, human mobility, as well as the impact on social and health inequalities. His work focuses uh, on developing spatial and data science tools, uh, data science tools and methods to examine the equity impacts of urban and transport planning policies on access to opportunities and environmental emissions. So Rafael obtained his PhD in, um, from the Transport Studies Unit at Oxford, and his work received the 2019, um, received in 2019 the best PhD thesis award transport, uh, in transportation from the AAG, and was also awarded the Younger Researcher of the Year by the OECD um, International Transport Forum. So Rafa, really uh, amazing pleasure to, um, to have you here, so thanks for accepting doing this, uh, and again, my apologies for that you cannot see everybody here, but um, I'll make sure to uh, convey the questions when they come, okay? Um, thank you. Sure. No worries. Uh, Ronaldo, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm very, very glad to be here even if virtually, uh, and it's a pleasure to be presenting at the seminar, and I hope we will get some good questions and discussions later on. Uh, so without further ado, I'll start. My name is Rafael Pereira, as Ronaldo just said. And I work at the Brazilian Institute for Applied Economic Research. So we are a Brazilian uh, research institution linked to the federal government, where we are basically doing research that is applied uh, or uh, applied to issues that uh, are int intricately related to policy. And I'm particularly focused on urban policies and transportation policy. Uh, but I'm also currently wearing the head of, head of, head of data science at the Institute. So I've been uh, doing lots of work as well in developing new tools and methods uh, for the work that we do and sharing those tools so that maybe it can benefit others as well. So I'll be talking today about spatial data science for just and sustainable cities, kind of just giving a high level view of some of the uh, research projects that have been carrying on over the past couple of years. Uh, but I was, I'd like to start talking about what I like to call a a revolution in mobility data. So I think you're all very familiar with the recent revolution we have seen in mobility data. Uh, this revolution uh, translates into the number and variety of data sets on mobility data sets that we have been seeing uh, popping up, either because we're talking about new data sets or just because we're talking about data sets that are not so new, but they are becoming more widely available, like from GPS, um, mobile phones, smart cars, LiDAR, traffic cameras, and portable emission measurement uh, devices. Um, so I'm sure you have, most of you have worked with this data or have read papers uh, with this data. And a lot of people praise about this revolution in, in terms of how we can do so much more with this uh, data that we have nowadays. However, I think very few people talk about uh, GTFS, which is, stands for General Transit Speed Specification. So GTFS is a standard data format for public transportation systems. It is basically a zipped file with several text files, and each text file is a table uh, with information about the transport agency, the routes, the trips, the calendars, uh, services, and so on and so forth. So it's basically a geolocated timetable organized as a bunch of text files and a relational table, so to speak. But I like, I like to say that uh, the GTFS has created a quiet revolution. Because the GTFS standard is so simple and so easy and it, it's so at the same time so comprehensive, it has become the uh, de facto data center for public transport worldwide. So it was originally created in the early 2000s by uh, Google with a partnership with the Transit Authority in Portland in the US. Uh, but it has spread very widely. So pretty much every mobile phone app that we have in our phones or 
navigating public transport systems or doing routing analysis or, or planning trips, uh, all of these mobile phone apps, uh, they are actually doing, making queries on top of GTFS data. And GTFS is now uh, a global standard in the sense that more than, uh, th th I think this map is already outdated. And I think I would say that nowadays we have more than 700 cities worldwide that share their GTFS data openly. And we're not even talking about the cities that have GTFS but don't share the data openly. This is just the open data for public transport systems in the world. And I say that uh, GTFS has uh, contributed to the mobility revolution because as we are talking about a simple data standard format that has been now ubiquitously used by so many people, uh, this creates a common ground for learning and development and code and so on and so forth. So uh, whenever like a PhD student or a transport agency develops a Python package to analyze GTFS data and extract some analytics or to plan fleet, uh, fleet dispatches or to analyze accessibility or transport conditions, that same tool that works for the city of Mumbai would work for Exeter or New York or Tokyo or Sao Paulo or uh, Madrid, for example. So this really crazy global community of, of people who are developing tools and, and, and software to work with GPFS data, but also uh, policymakers and transit agencies that can use those tools to uh, inform their policy and planning. And a lot of the work that I do uh, works uh, is built on top of GTFS data. I, I also have lots of other work that do not, where we don't use GTFS data, but GTFS is, I would say, is a big part of the, the work that I do. So it's like a, a common, a common data set that I use in a lot of my work. And today I'll be talking about two specific projects. One of them is the Access to Opportunities project, and the other one uh, is a project about public transport emissions. We still don't have a catchy name for that project, so I'm happy to have any suggestions, uh, hear any suggestions you might have. So I'll talk a bit about the Access to Opportunities project first, and then I'll dive into the emissions uh, project. First, I just wanted to clarify what I mean by accessibility. Uh, so here's a person in, in the middle of the city, this is the city of Port Alegre, Brazil. And in this city, like many other cities worldwide, we have plenty of opportunities. There are several, like schools, hospitals, uh, public services, restaurants, uh, cafes, libraries, and so on and so forth. But the, the, the thing is, this person using public transport can only reach this area highlighted in yellow in 30 minutes. This means that this person cannot reach within this travel time budget using this specific transport mode. She cannot reach all of those restaurants that she has available to her in the city. There's only so many, there are only so many restaurants she can reach. And this, this is what we mean by accessibility. Accessibility reflects how easy it is for that person to get to those activities. So we can measure accessibility in several ways. You, you're probably familiar, there are, there are dozens and dozens of different accessibility metrics. But all of these accessibility metrics have in common the fact that they are trying to measure the quantity of activities or opportunities the person is able to reach the variety of opportunities she's able to reach, and, the, and some par qualitative characteristics of the opportunities she's able to reach. And usually we can simply sum the number of opportunities that falls within this yellow area here, which would be a very simple accessibility metric, the number of restaurants you can reach within 30 minutes. But usually we discount the, va the value or the importance of restaurants or activities based on the travel cost to get to them. So Restaurants that are closer to you are more important and more relevant, and restaurants that are further away from you are less important, following the uh, uh, intuition of a gravitational curve. Uh, we can also account for competition. Uh, let's say that too many people can access the same hospital, but this is the only hospital in the city. So there will be a lot of competition for the healthcare resources that a hospital has, and we can also discount for that. So this is the general idea of framework about what we mean about accessibility. It, it measures how easy it is for a person to reach, to reach activities and opportunities. And the thing is, to have a good understanding of, of how a... Sorry. <clears throat> Apologies. 
And to understand how how the uh, accessibility landscape of a city uh, behaves, we have to really look into three different things. We have to consider the spatial distribution of the population, the spa spatial distribution of activities, but also the spatial and temporal performance of transportation uh, networks. And we're trying to look at those three things uh, in, in, at a very large scale in Brazil in the Access to Opportunities Project. So the Access to Opportunities Project is a spin-off from my PhD research that I finished in 2018. And since I moved back to Brazil, I've been trying to expand the, 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 some accessible tools to the whole country. So the Access to Opportunities Project has three main aims. The first one is to generate annual estimates to, of access to employment, health services, education services, and social, wear, social welfare by uh, different transport modes for Brazil's largest urban areas. Uh, all of the, uh, the second aim is that we are putting everything publicly available, so all the data that we use, uh, are, uh, we make it uh, publicly available, including uh, the data that we generate, the code we generate, and also providing some interactive data visualizations that could be of interest to um, local governments and, and communities. And finally, uh, we want to get all of this data publicly available so that not only us, we are not the only ones working with the data, but also uh, transport uh, agencies, PhD and master's students, and, re and uh, NGOs and civil society more broadly can use this data to inform planning uh, and evaluation of policies in general. And I'm here talking about uh, not only transportation policies, but also uh, education policies. Where should we build a school? Where should we build a uh, healthcare facility? Or so, and so on and so forth. So at the moment, uh, this is the general scope of the Access to Opportunities Project. Up until today, we have generated accessibility estimates for 2017, 18, and 19. We had to stop due to COVID uh, for various reasons. It wouldn't make much sense to generate access to uh, employment, for example, during COVID, since a lot of, uh, of, of, a lot of the economic activity was shut down. A lot of the transport systems were very different uh, and, and, and suspended and so on. But we are hoping we will be re resuming the project with generating new estimates from 2022 onwards. Uh, we currently have access uh, estimates by walking, cycling, public transport, and by cars, and the accessibility by car uh, accounts for historic uh, traffic congestion levels. For all of those three years, 2017, 18, and 19, we have accessibility estimates at a very high spatial resolution, I would say roughly at the block level for the 20 largest cities in Brazil. Uh, the cities in blue are the cities for which we only have uh, active transport modes and by car, and the cities in green are the cities for which we have access for all of those transport modes. Uh, and next, here at the uh, bottom left of the screen, you'll see that we are expanding the project for the whole country. So, while today we only have 20 cities, we'll be expanding the project to 5,550 cities approximately uh, this year. Hopefully we'll get the results published uh, in, yeah, this year I mean 2024. We have already started working on this, but the results should only be available uh, by the end of 2015. Uh, just so you have a general idea what, uh, in terms of, in practical terms, what are we measuring exactly? This is the map uh, of the city of Sao Paulo. So in this map, you see uh, the proportion of jobs that can be reached using public transport within one hour. So even if you're not familiar with Sao Paulo, you can see that uh, most of the jobs are concentrated near the city center. And that you, and you can see the high capacity transportation corridors like the subways, uh, the BRT lines, the train lines, and so on and so forth. I always like to highlight this area here in Sao Paulo. This is the Zona Leste, or the east zone in the city. This is a very uh, well-known area for being economically deprived, with very low socioeconomic indicators, with very low economic activity. And as you see, it is mostly dominated by these dark colors, uh, which are areas from which you would have access to less than uh, fewer than 5% of the jobs in the city. Uh, however, in the middle of this desert of opportunity, you have this one bright spot. And this is a subway station and a train station. 
So uh, we are here not talking about simply the geographical proximity between people and jobs. We are also talking about how the spatial and temporal performance and connectivity of your transportation network allows you to get closer very easily uh, and to reach those jobs very, very conveniently. Uh, so this is just one simple accessibility metric for jobs. We also have another type of metric where we measure the travel time that takes you to get to the closest activity. Uh, this is the travel time to the closest hot room. Uh, using public transport. So uh, areas in yellow are places from which you would take less than five minutes to get to a hospital, and uh, areas in green you would take something between 10 and 20 minutes, and dark blue areas are places from where you would take over 30 minutes. So there is a big variation in terms of the spatial distribution of healthcare services, but also about how transportation corridors connect people with uh, those uh, services. Um, the Access to Opportunities Project, as I said, generates estimates of various different accessibility indicators. These are just two that we consider. Uh, these estimates can be disaggregated by population age, income, race, and sex. Uh, we also access major access to jobs by different education levels, uh, schools, and health services of different types as well. And in the end of the day, we generate such a huge amount of data that there are like tons and tons of research uh, questions that we can address with them. We don't have enough legs and arms to do that our, ourselves. So oftentimes we collaborate with different colleagues and, and governments to uh, generate some papers and projects. Uh, this is just one example. So in 2021, we partnered with, with Wu and Levinson and colleagues uh, and many other colleagues indeed. Uh, this was a project where we gathered accessibility estimates for over 117 cities across 16 countries, uh, just looking at access to employment by different transport modes, and we compared the, the performance of different cities depending on their city size. Uh, it was very interesting to see how uh, uh, North American cities are really bad in terms of transit accessibility, uh, really bad in terms of walking accessibility, where North, North American cities are kind of ex as expected, uh, not that bad when it comes to access by car. Uh, still, Chinese cities and um, uh, some European cities are actually have much better than U.S. cities when it comes to access by car. Uh, anyway, so there, uh, uh, there would be a bunch of stuff to unpack from uh, the similar uh, charts here, but I, I'll, I'm moving on for the next paper. And this is a study we published in 2021. This was just very, very early in the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we used the first round of the AOP project uh, to estimate access to healthcare services, including um, um, uh, mechanical respiratory machines and uh, UCI beds across all of the 20 Brazilian cities that we had. And we were particularly focused on trying to understand uh, the income and racial inequalities when it comes to act, having access to those uh, healthcare services. Uh, and, and not surprisingly, we found that uh, low-income communities and black communities have systematically lower access to health services in pretty much every Brazilian city. And these results become even, these inequalities become even more stark when we account for competition. So as I said before, uh, in, in cases like we, the one we have with COVID. Uh, it's not simply a matter of whether you live close or, or not to a hospital. If that's the only hospital you have in the region, everyone you know will be going to the same hospital, and you'll be waiting on a queue to get you know some uh, to get the service. So this was uh, critical for life supporting systems during COVID, and we uh, used a more sophisticated accessibility metric that account for that uh, competition as well. Uh, more recently, we've been doing some partnerships with Uber, and we've been receiving some very, very rich uh, data sets with uh, trips from Uber. And, uh, we have actually already published a paper that came out in, on the journal Cities this month, uh, where we are analyzing accessibility by ride-hailing services compared with uh, public transport, but also compared with how much accessibility you have when you combine ride-hailing with public transport. If you could use ride-hailing as a first-mile connection to uh, public transport. 
Uh, this map that I'm, I'm, I'm showing you here are not part of that paper. It's just because I find this map really nice, uh, and I, I, I thought that Ronaldo would appreciate them. Uh, this is a map, these are maps showing the spatial patterns of the crit flows of the, on the top left, the 20% wealthiest neighborhoods in, in Rio. So all of, all of the strips that depart from the wealthiest neighborhoods, and at the bottom, all the strips that depart from the poorest neighborhoods. And I think uh, you don't need to be uh, very familiar with the city of Rio de Janeiro to understand how much this map represents in terms of mobility segregation and, and, and uh, very dramatically different spatial mobility patterns between the rich and the poor. Uh, but going into the methods and the data that we use to generate all of those accessibility estimates, uh, we use a kind of a data fusion approach where we combine several types of data set from different sources. So going from the bottom uh, to the top, we use satellite imagery data to get elevation information. Uh, household service, like the census from which we get information on facial distribution of people uh, by income, race, age, and so on and so forth. Uh, we combine this with geolocated administrative records where we have the location of uh, uh, employment, uh, health facilities, uh, schools, and so on and so forth. And lastly, uh, we have to use some transportation network data. So we are using uh, collaborative uh, data from OpenStreetMap and GKFS data for the cities we, we can find GKFS data and so on. And when we combine all of these, we can actually arrive at those accessibility estimates that I talked to you about. Uh, to do this, uh, there are several different packages and computational tools to do this both in Python and R and Java and so many other languages. In our case, we are using a package we developed called R5R. So R5R stands for Rapid Realistic Routing with R5 in R. And some of you might uh, be familiar with, R5 is a routing engine, as a multimodal routing engine uh, developed by Convail. Uh, we developed an R package that is a wrapper around R5. So R5 is, is written in Java which is extremely efficient. Not many people know this. I didn't know this before. It, it, it's super fast and very efficient, but not many people know how to write in, in code with Java. So our team developed this R package that uh, you can simply run some R functions, very simple, and you can do lots of stuff with R5 in your local computer, and it's incredibly fast and efficient, as I'll show you in a minute. So uh, with R5, we can do fast routing on multimodal transportation networks to calculate travel time distances, travel matrices, trip planning, item phone, accessibility. We can account for the level of traffic stress for cycling trips at terrain elevation. Uh, we can estimate the monetary travel cost of trips and also account for different, uh, using use time window strategies to account for uh, different departure times and so on and so forth. I know from in, 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 in computer science circles, people are not so much familiar with R, people generally prefer to work Python. So we have more recently developed R5 Pi for those who are Pythonists, uh, which is kind of our sister package. And nowadays R5R is a little bit more advanced because it, it's older, but R5 Pi is also very, very uh, uh, fantastic to work out. So just for the R users in the room, uh, you can calculate the travel time matrix and isochrones is just one simple uh, uh, function call. I will not talk about the, the parameters here, it doesn't really matter so right now, but just so you see, you can do trip planning to find different trip alternatives between uh, point A and point B. So a very uh, traditional routing, uh, routing model and route analysis, but here we're talking about a, a tool that is incredibly efficient. Um, some colleagues from Toronto University published a paper uh, performing a benchmark between uh, network analysts and RTIS, uh, OpenStreetPlanner, which is another uh, a popular uh, routing engine, R5R and ME. And uh, the bottom line of the comparison is that when we're talking about extremely large uh, origin destination matrices with 10,000 by 10,000, 10,000 origins to 10,000 destinations. Uh, R5R is six times larger than RGIS, uh, 37 times larger than OTP, and 100 times larger than ME. Uh, this means, like, instead of taking 50 minutes in, in RGIS, you would take eight minutes in R5. It's 
you were talking about smaller travel time matrices with a thousand by a thousand. R5 can do this in nine seconds. And if you're going to really extremely large matrices, a hundred thousand by a hundred thousand, none of the uh, programs were able to finish the query. Uh, R5R was the only one that would finish this in, in eight, 18 hours. And it could be even faster. I, I think they, they didn't perform, they didn't write the code for R5R the most efficient way, but anyway. Uh, so we also developed several other computational packages that accompany the Access to Opportunities project. So in the accessibility package, there are uh, we have various uh, functions that conveniently allow uh, researchers to calculate multiple, like dozens of different accessibility metrics uh, from the uh, time to the closest and activities to different types of cumulative opportunity, gravity-based uh, measures, floating catchment area measures, and any decay function you can uh, customize and so on and so forth. And actually, we also have the AOP data package. So the Access to Opportunities Project data is available in the AOP data package. So uh, in very simple terms, you can have access to all of the data that we produce openly available in R. You can also download it from our website, but it's much easier to download it in R. So you would have information about the space distribution of population, land use activities, accessibility estimates by different transport modes, peak time, off-peak, and so on and so forth. One example. For those who are uh, familiar with R, you can call this function AOP data dot 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 read access. So city of Curitiba, mode, public transport, year, um, what off-peak, and I don't want to show the progress bar. So with just one function call, I download data in one, one ggplot, which is equivalent to the matplotlib library in Python, I create this map. Is this the most beautiful map you have ever seen in your life? Definitely no. But it's really fascinating how we can empower researchers and, and policymakers to create very simple and quickly, very, very, very easily and quickly create data visualizations and extract data information uh, with two lines of code. It, it's super uh, uh, nice to see uh, that we have seen many uh, local governments and researchers in Brazil using this data. For those who are more interested in diving into accessibility and accessibility modeling, we have recently published a book called Introduction to Urban Accessibility, a Practical Guide to R. Uh, this is an online book, so it, you can download the PDF, but the book is entirely written in Parto, on, so it, it, the website is online. And the book covers from basic concepts and indicators to a more hands-on approach as a tutorial teaching how to estimate accessibility, how to evaluate the accessibility impact of transportation projects, how to wrangle and analyze GTFS data, and the entire book is written with reproducible example and code, so anyone can use it. So, uh, having said all of that for the first project, I'll, I'll talk about the second project, but I promise I'll be faster in the second project because there are not as many things to talk about this one. At least not yet. So, in this project for which we still don't have a catchy name, uh, we are developing a scalable model for public transport emissions. Uh, the main idea here is that we, we develop a computational model that allows us to evaluate the environmental benefits and the justice implications of different policies that will you know, try to electrify or, or transport fleet or buy new buses and replace old buses with new buses. Uh, the old method is intended to have minimum data requirements uh, and it tries to help individuals and, and environmental agencies work with uh, reproducible projects and open science uh, standards. So we developed this method called the GTFS to emit. Uh, this has also been published a, as a R package, uh, which stands for Public Transport Emissions from GTFS. And it was recently published in uh, Transport Research Part D, uh, where the, the paper basically describes in very like a thorough detail uh, how the method works and how the package uh, can be used. So it's, it's an R package that provides a generalizable method to estimate public transport emissions at high spatial, but also at high temporal resolution, uh, simply leveraging on GTFS uh, standard data format. This is the, 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 the nice thing about the matter, I'm very proud of the fact that the user only needs two inputs, uh, two pieces of input to work with the, with the model. 
So if you want to estimate GTFS for the city of Exeter, for example, you would only need a GTFS fee for Exeter. I know GTFS for the UK is not super trivial because the UK uh, uses different, uses, usually uh, have uh, different standards uh, for transportation data, but there are already many tools to convert uh, uh, that standard to GTFS, so it shouldn't be super, super complicated. So you would only need GTFS data for the city of Exeter, and the table telling some basic characteristics of your public transport fee. And we are talking about either a, a detailed table that tells you the characteristics of each individual vehicle, or a simple table that gives us, that gives us the average composition, let's say 20% of the buses are standard buses with Euro 4 phase, and 18% of the buses are Euro 5, and so on and so forth. Those are the only two pieces of input that you need to use the model. Apart from that, the user only needs to select uh, what pollutants he or she is interested in analyzing, and the, 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 the package currently has uh, over 16 uh, different pollutants. And you need to select the emission factor model that is already provided in the package. So we currently have emission factor models by, uh, for Brazil, for Europe, and the United States. Uh, an emission factor model, for those who are not familiar, is basically a, a function that tells you what are the expected level of emissions for a, for a given vehicle with given characteristics traveling at, at a given speed. So a lot of uh, environmental agencies go to the field and to labs and they, they measure the emissions of different vehicles with different characteristics at different environmental conditions. And with those measurements, they create these emission factor models that tell us what, are, what would be the expected emission for vehicles in, with these different characteristics. So ultimately, what the GTFS to GPS, uh, sorry, the GTFS to NIST model is doing is that first, uh, you need to use a transport model function that will convert the GTFS data into a trajectory data set. So you can have uh, the trajectory of every single individual in a more standard format, like a GPS data. And after that, you have to run the emission model, the second and final step, where you input the fleet information and the emission factor model that you chose, and it will generate, it, it will combine the trajectory data with the emission factor models, and it will generate emission levels uh, bottom-up for every single vehicle at every single moment of the day. Uh, uh, how many grams of CO2 that vehicle is emitting at different uh, moments of the day in different uh, segments of the road uh, road network, for example. Uh, so just a simple uh, example for the city of Sao Paulo, uh, you see CO2 emissions and PM10 emissions. Even if you're not familiar with Sao Paulo, you can clearly uh, spot where the large capacity bus corridors here. And this is just a zoom in the city center where you see uh, a lot of a lot of the uh, avenues or places nearby uh, bus de depots, you have this overlap of too many routes and sometimes older buses. So you have this uh, different spatial distribution of emissions. Uh, the data is, uh, as, as I said, at a fine spatial and temporal detail. So you can also aggregate the emissions at, from a spatial temporal uh, uh, patterns. Because we are using standard GTFS data and GTFS is the global data, it's, it, it is rel relatively easy to generate such emissions for global cities. Here you have Houston and US, uh, Sydney, Australia, Curitiba and Brazil, and Rome in Italy. So as uh, moving forward, we are currently writing a, uh, a paper where we are building an environmental benchmark, comparing the environmental emission level per passenger across uh, several global cities. We are trying to aim for 50 cities but we are currently only with 30 cities in, in uh, Europe, North America, Latin America, uh, and, I, and Australia as well. Uh, ideally, uh, I, it would be nice to see people using this kind of model to evaluate the environmental benefits of different policies, uh, like uh, replacing old buses or electrifying buses. Uh, a civil society organization from Cairo in Egypt, together with WRI, they just used this model to generate um, uh, environmental emission estimates for, uh, I think, a city in Zambia and Africa. 
And ultimately, it would be nice to combine the output of, of GDFS to this with, with several other more sophisticated measures and, and, and models of air, air, uh, air dissipation and pollution dissipation to have a look at social inequalities in what neighborhoods and socioeconomic groups are more or less exposed uh, to pollution and pollution. Uh, so I would finish here, but I just wanted to highlight something. Remember that to use the GDFS to this model, we needed two steps. And the first step was to convert the GDFS data into trajectory data. So uh, you don't need to know this if you want to uh, if we're working with the GKFS transmission model, you don't need to know what I'm going to say now. But if you're really, if you're very interested in diving deep into this, what we call the transport model view here, actually under the hood is running another package we developed called GTFS to GPS. So GTFS to GPS is a simple R package that does one simple thing, but it does it very well and very efficiently. It converts the GTFS feed into a GPS-like data table, basically a trajectory uh, data with space-time trajectories of every single individual. Uh, and it's super simple, but at the same time, it's very powerful in the sense that it opens up so many possibilities of different research uh, questions that you can either get rest with trajectory data, but not so much with GTFS, because GTFS is a real strange relational table that doesn't work uh, as well with, with many applications. Uh, and a very simple example with, uh, with the output of the GTFS to GPS model, we can have a look at the, uh, a 3D perspective or, is our, or a time geography perspective on the space-time trajectory of different vehicles uh, and the coupling of different vehicles and at what time of the day and in space they would be able to bunch or meet uh, together. Uh, and more recently, we published a paper on geographical systems uh, where we explain the, the package, we uh, uh, go into detail how it works and uh, what it can be used to, to do. Uh, and a very simple analysis, we, we look, looking at the output of GKFS to GPS, we estimated what is the average frequency of transit services in different areas of the city of Sao Paulo and how the frequency of those services vary across different times of the day and the x-axis here and by different income designs. So these are basically, these two are basically the same length, the same chart, but one is a 2D and the other one is a 3D version of the same result. And here we are looking at how the frequency of public transport services vary across different times of the day for different income groups. And we see that Regardless of the time of the day when you look, the richest income deciles here at the top of the pier, they usually have relatively higher frequency. They are much better served by public transportation services, um, regardless of time of the day. So you have the, the peak and off-peak time variations for pretty much every neighborhood, uh, but regardless of those variations, the uh, services for high-income neighborhoods are systematically and consistently uh, higher than for middle income and low income neighborhoods as well. So I just, uh, I think I've already presented for over 40 minutes, 42 minutes. I think that's a little bit too long. I uh, hope I didn't get you bored and you're not slipping over the other side. Uh, so that's all I had to present. Uh, and I'm very happy to engage with you and take any questions and discussion uh, you might have. That's okay, thank you. That's So I think I managed to get at least my camera here, so you can see that <coughs> that's, these, these are not fake claps, there are people here, right? <laughs> yeah, so any question? Yeah? Uh, can, should I come yeah, down? No, I, I, you kept your phone, the, the microphone. Okay, well, can you hear me? Yes, okay, cool. Um, you've developed lots of these really cool looking models, and I was just wondering how you go about validating uh, their correctness, because she didn't really talk about uh, the, the emissions in particular. How, how, how is it accurate? I assume it is, but I'm just curious about how you go about measuring that. Very good point. So, um, when it comes to the emission model, we can think of validation in terms of two, two different aspects. Uh, well, 
you, by validation, I mean comparing real emission data with, um, with the estimated emissions that we have. Uh, we don't have emission, we don't have measured emissions from uh, the transportation system, the public transportation system of Kampalan. So we have not been able to validate against that direct measurement. However, we have been able to validate against a different uh, model that uses GPS data. So here we're talking about two basic inputs, the GPS data that gives you the transport information, the information of the transport system, and the emission factor models that tells you the relationship between buses or vehicles characteristics and emission estimate. Uh, there, is, there is an environmental agency based in Sao Paulo that used the same environmental emission factors that we use, but instead of looking at GTFS data, they look at GPS data. So instead of having uh, the services that were planned to be delivered in the GTFS format, they were looking at the services that were actually delivered to the population with the, GP, with the GPS historical records. <laughs> When we compared those two, uh, the results are very, very close. There are, there are, there are obviously some differences, but mind you that the differences there, they arise because of the differences between the GPS data and the GPS pass data, the planned service and the delivered service. Uh, I would say the, uh, the way we, in the paper that we published uh, in Transport Research Part D, where we present the model, we present this uh, validation. So, I wouldn't say exactly so it is a validation because we're just looking at the transportation input quality. Uh, ideally, we would want to validate against uh, local emissions uh, measured locally and in, uh, at vehicle by vehicle, but we don't have that kind of measurement uh, in Brazil, and I'm, I think we don't have it anywhere. Maybe we might have it in some place, in, in some cities that I don't know of. But, uh, like, because usually we have these measurements like by samples and uh, for some vehicles, and rarely we, we, we see this measurement for every single vehicle in the entire city. Uh, are you thinking about the validation about some other models specifically, or? Um, it was more to do, so I presume we have uh, pollution sensors in, in these cities, and they must measure aggregate emissions. So I was thinking about sort of the ag aggregate quality of the model compared to what's actually measured in in the, yeah. in the so the thing, the, it would be possible to compare our results with aggregate emission uh, models, like satellite imagery data. Uh, there are plenty of uh, models that generate this aggregate emission mod, uh, results. The problem is we are only looking at public transport emissions, and they respond. I mean, relatively to all of the other emission sources, they respond to a relatively small share of those sources. So. I think it would be a challenge to have an accurate validation comparing yeah. like total emissions for all all different sources in the city against public transport emissions. I'm, I'm not sure that would be a good uh, correspondence between the two. You would be able to have a, a rigorous validation just comparing the aggregate total emissions for every different source, for all different sources against just looking at public transport. But it, it might be an interesting idea. Yeah, uh, I remember there is a model by the European Commission, I think it's the EDGAR. So those who have worked with uh, emission data, there is a data set called EDGAR, or EDGAR project by the European Commission, and they use satellite imagery data to generate emission levels by different emission sources at a one kilometer by one kilometer grid for the entire globe since, I don't know, the 1970s or 1980s. It is a fantastic data set. Uh, the data set they have generate, uh, allows you to have estimates of emissions by the transport sector. So I think this could be the closest we would get, but still it doesn't untangle what is emissions from the private transportation, public transportation, or freight transportation, for example. So it would be a challenge to do what you're thinking, but I think it could be an interesting avenue to pursue. Well, so, somewhat related to this, how easy is this package? For us to, for instance, I have a different model of of emission. How how is it? Can I add a different model of emission to just generate this visualization? Maybe compare with other models, like using the package. 
Well, uh, currently, uh, the emission, the package only accepts the emission factor models that we have into the package. So we downloaded the emission factor models, or the data of the emission factor models for all of those environmental agencies, and we included them into uh, the, the package. So the, the package currently only works with those emission models. But I think it would be relatively easy to adapt the, the code of the package to make it more uh, friendly to receive other emission factor models, as long as, the, as they are in the, in, the, in the standard format uh, with the, the data, the standard of the data frame with the, the name of the columns uh, that we use. It should be doable. So. Rafa, thanks for the talk. Uh, um, I mean, first, uh, Hugo just texted me asking to apologize that he had to leave to pick up his kids. So he wanted to ask a few questions, but he didn't send me the questions. So I wish he did. But uh, uh, the, my, my point is, is uh, how do you actually deal with uh, when you, your, your estimations of accessibility? I mean, I, and I don't know how to word this very well, but how do you deal with the fact that uh, you have transient population. What I mean is like this, right? So you, I can have a hospital next to my house, but if I'm never there, it doesn't really matter to me, right? So for instance, if I spend most of my time somewhere else, my accessibility is, it's, 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 it's inaccurate to say that I have access to a hospital when I'm not at home. So I said, so how would you I mean, how do you consider those factors that are more related to the dynamics of the city? And, and then this ties, for instance, how would that change on a pandemic situation? Because dynamics will change. So does it make sense what I'm trying to get? I mean, how, because it seems that your estimation is more like static, right? So you give a position, there's how long it takes to get to a hospital. Um, yeah, so that's, a very, that's a, actually a very good question. This is the first time I get this question. I usually get always the same questions. The first two questions I get, I got today are not uh, very common, so I, I, I appreciate that. And this particular question is very good, Ronaldo, because the results that I'm presenting, uh, as, I, as I said, it's kind of a high-level view of the research project. So I'm just talking about the general overview of the results and estimates. We, uh, I don't go into the details here. Uh, and your question gives me the opportunity, gives me the opportunity to do that. So. When we generate this accessibility estimate, we generate accessibility estimates for every single point in the city. Naturally, when we generate the analysis from, for, the, for most of the research questions we have been addressing at the Access to Opportunities Project and trying to help you know, local governments and thinking about where to place a school or a hospital, whatever, we usually talk about accessibility from the residential location. So considering where people live, what is the accessibility from where they live? However, we, the question you raised talks about, it relates very closely to the issue of trick chaining. You might leave your house, go to drop, drop your kids at school, and then after you drop your kids at school, uh, you have to go to your job. And let's say it, like dropping your, your, your kid at school is a mandatory activity. And there is no other kindergarten near your home. So you will take, like, a car will, or a bus, you will take, like, five, ten minutes on the vehicle, you'll get to the kindergarten. Once you are at the kindergarten, the number of jobs you can access is different from the jobs you can access from where you were at home. But we have the number of jobs that you can reach when you depart from the kindergarten at that specific point in time as well. So ultimately, we can calculate a space-time queue of accessibility for every single point in this, from every single point in the city at every single minute in the city. And with this space-time cube, you can calculate accessibility from a more dynamic perspective, where you account for the previous trips that people took, and from where they're standing at the moment, what further accessibility they, further uh, opportunities they could access further uh, down the line. No, I hope that no it, it, it does, and, and thanks for answering that. I mean, but just uh, following up, I mean, my, my point is, is, is also related to the, I mean, t take another example here, right? So uh, I may have, even if you have the calculations and you can actually estimate more, a more dynamic one, you have estimations for the accessibility, that is still a factor which is perhaps the capacity of the location, right? So, I mean, mm -hmm. the fact that I have a hospital next to my house doesn't mean that I can go there, right? Because, yes. uh, so... 
Is, is it possible so, to adapt to those things? about two things. Right. The first thing is calculating the travel time estimates, right? So the space-time cube I, I, I mentioned, you can think about a, a space-time cube of travel time matrices. So you can have this, the travel time required to go from every point in the city to every other point in the city <coughs> at every single minute of the city. So those travel times, they vary from place to place and across different times of the day. The second step is when you convert those travel time matrices into accessibility. So the first time of, of your question, I addressed in a way that mostly refers to the travel time cubes. So from everywhere, you can estimate this travel time variations across different times of the day. The second part of your question about, okay, but what about service capacity? What about the quality of the restaurant or uh, the type of school or quality of the school that I'm interested in? So for that second part of the question, we need to think about different types of accessibility metrics. How do you combine lens use information, the characteristics and the capacity of the services with those travel time estimates to generate accessibility metrics? So in the COVID-19 paper that I uh, um, mentioned earlier, we use this new accessibility metric called balanced floating catchment area, which is a relatively new metric that was proposed in 2021 by Pius and colleagues, where they measure accessibility accounting both for, for the travel time that get, that takes you from, to go from your home or your location to the next hospital, but it also accounts for the capacity of the hospital and the, to account for the number of other people that could reach the same hospital and for the fact that the same person could reach different hospitals. So the same person could reach different hospitals, the same hospital could be reached by different people. Yeah. How do you account for this dynamic uh, allocation of service supply and population demand? And this balanced floating catchment area method and other metrics in the accessibility uh, world are precisely trying to do that, to measure accessibility accounting for those competition effects. Thank you. So I have another comment, but I don't know. Uh, I have a quick question regarding like the, the first study that you show. You show that you have like data about bicycles. How, how, how is that? How is that measured? The use of bikes in the city. So the uh, remember that. I think just a, a quick clarification that perhaps might be related to your question. When we are talking about this accessibility estimates we are not talking about people's travel behavior. We are not talking about where people live and where they travel to, or how often they travel and how long they take. We are talking about hypothetical trips. We are modeling with these routing engines what would be the route that people would have taken to go from there. What is the travel time that would have taken them to make those trips? So we are not looking at people's cycling trips, uh, observed cycling trips. We are looking at how easy it would be for them to take to make those bicycle trips. Oh. And to do this, we, we use the routing engine models that I mentioned to you. Uh, in the case of R5R and a few others, but specifically R5R, we are estimating uh, travel times accounting for the, uh, the network connectivity and topology uh, and distances of the, trans of the transportation network. It accounts for uh, cycling infrastructure, but it also accounts for terrain elevation and it also accounts for level of traffic strength. So you can input into the model what is the tolerance level that you have for level of traffic stress. Let's say you were a, a, a family with small children, you wouldn't want to cycle in a very busy area. So the routing algorithm would allow would avoid uh, those types of, of road segments. Uh, if you're a uh, young like a, like, a, uh, like a young male in Lycra in London, you might be willing to face high congested uh, streets and busy routes. So your level of traffic, your, your tolerance to the level of traffic stresses are different, and the routing engine accounts for those uh, preferences, uh, so to speak. Okay, so it, uh, I, I wasn't getting it wrong. So why do you have like some cities that you don't have this, you don't use like bicycles? Data, like oh, actually, actually, we, we actually have accessibility estimates by walking, cycling, and car for every city. The only 
I think the, the main limitation we have is that the public transport data in GPFS format is not easily available for many cities in Brazil. Uh, like many cities have the data, but they don't share it publicly, or it belongs to the bus companies, not to the uh, city government, for example. Uh, this, this thing happened in, in a few low to middle income countries. It's, it's weird, but it happens. Uh, but walking and cycling, we can do it for uh, anywhere in the world, actually. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, I was wondering if you could speak a bit about the work you did with the ride hailing services and like whether the mobility segregation you found was kind of like whether or not it was an artifact of poor transit service to that area or like are people just taking like or like doing ride hailing to areas that is poorly served by transit and then they'll use transit to like the wealthier areas right because we have yeah. transit systems that serve that area okay so so maybe a caveat there, maybe in my presentation, I, I, I'm sure I wasn't clear enough. Uh, I brought that, I brought those maps with the flows uh, just to kind of get your attention and, and provoke some thought about mobility segregation. But we haven't yet written the study looking at mobility segregation with that specific data, right? So the, 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 the paper that we have written that came out published this month is a paper where we look at employment accessibility only using right hailing services, employment accessibility only using public transport, and employment accessibility combining both right hailing as a first mile with public transport. Uh, the nice thing about that specific paper is that we account for both travel time and monetary costs. Obviously, right hailing is much more efficient and much has a much better performance than public transport when it comes to travel speed and convenience, but it's, all, but it's, it's at the same time much more expensive. So they have much higher out-of-pocket costs. Um, so we were trying to account for this trade-off between travel time and travel cost when comparing transit and, and ride hailing. Uh, we found that ride hailing has a much better uh, performance for uh, shorter trips because that's when you have relatively cheaper trips and much much higher accessibility by right hailing than by transit. However, in Brazil, public transport is uh, based on a flat fare scheme. So it doesn't matter how far you travel, you always pay the same, the same it's, a, it's a fixed value, it's a fixed fare. So for uh, trips over 25, 30 minutes, it's much better to use public transport than to use uh, right hailing. But obviously the answer to this question depends on, on the person. If you're a poor person, you're probably poor in terms of money and not poor in terms of time. Wealthy individuals, on the other hand, they are poor of time and not so much poor of money. So uh, there is this trade-off of, of how much time or how much money you're willing to spend on travel. And I think uh, this is the second paper that accounts for this trade-off between travel time and money in accessibility and transportation networks. If you look at the transportation modeling literature from computer science, transport engineering, urban planning, urban planning, we usually use this route algorithms to return the fastest trip or the shortest path. So we always have this uh, single dimension objective function that tries to minimize the travel time. The problem is, once you account for travel time and monetary costs at the same time, your routing algorithm has to account for this trade-off during the routing analysis. So your, your, the optimal trip is not one trip, is a Pareto frontier of multiple trip alternatives that would give you the optimal Pareto frontier of combinations of different travel times and different travel costs. So you could have the cheapest travel just walking, you'd spend zero, zero pounds, but it would take you 50 minutes to get to the train station. Or you could take a black cab that would take maybe 10 minutes, but would cost you 20 pounds. And between those two options, there are various intermediary uh, alternatives. So when we account for this trade-off between travel time and cost, we bring a much more nuanced and, and complex uh, situation for transportation network models. And I think, as far as I know, most of the literature only look at travel time 
when they look at travel cost, what you, we usually see is that they they calculate the travel, the, the fastest trip, and they calculate what would be the monetary cost of the fastest trip. So they're not really looking at the, the trade-off between travel time and cost. They're just looking at the cost of the fastest trip. And then they use this, um, they convert the travel time into money, or they convert the monetary cost into travel time using uh, salary equivalents to uh, hourly wages, right? So uh, this, as far as we know, this is the second paper that is ever published looking at this trade-off, and not only looking at the analysis, but also looking at the routing algorithm uh, level. So we didn't, we didn't invent the routing algorithm. This was developed by the guys at R5, uh, Comeo with R5. And I think one of the most exciting things about this project is precisely that it makes it very easily for other people to use this new tool that provides much more sophisticated uh, analysis and, and that allows us to think with new lenses about this complex interrelationship between travel costs and, and travel times as well. So thank you for your question. Yeah, last one. I have a question. <clears throat> so how, maybe the same uh, type of question for how to validate these systems. How um, have you ever tried to use these systems to generate what if scenarios and then validate it with events that have happened in these cities which have altered so suppose you have a major traffic accident and congestion that is completely unforeseen and then you see whether you could use your models to get some estimates of what would happen in these situations but now you also have a proof of concept because this event has happened uh, no, we haven't, but it's actually a great idea. Uh, so uh, we have done a lot of work looking at GPS versus GPFS data. So I have a PhD student uh, who I've supervised where we, we use the GP, historical GPS data of the transport system. We convert it into GTFS, like a, a historic GTFS, like a real GTFS. And we compare how much accessibility levels vary or how much accessibility levels differ when you consider planned services and delivered services. Uh, other colleagues have done this in the US, colleagues from the University of Ohio uh, and the University of Toronto. And uh, across the board, we find that uh, there are systematic differences, and the differences are not, they're not uh, random. So low-income neighborhoods and neighborhoods in the peripheries and, and, uh, and busy corridors are, are, are the ones where you have less reliability of the transport service. Uh, because the, those are places where you either have more congestion or because you have uh, worse, how to say, worse accountability, so to speak. So if the, if the bus company doesn't make that trip, maybe the local community will not have the political voice to complain about that. Uh, but what you're saying perhaps might be even more relevant for the emission model, right? And I, we have never done this, but I think it could be very interesting because what you're saying is that you could use this external shock as kind of a, um, almost like a natural experiment to yes. see how an unexpected disruption in service would be subsequently followed by a disruption in emission levels as well. Uh, I think to do that, we would, be, we would require high temporal resolution data for emissions. So, you would, you would need to have emission estimates being measured every single hour, for example, uh, at different places in, in the city. Uh, so I think that could be doable, but I, I've never thought about that. That could be very, very interesting research. I'm glad if you, if, I'm glad if you pursue that research and tell me later if it works. Sure. Okay, I think we are out of time. Uh, thank you so much for your interest talk and for your time responding questions and thank you all for coming. See you. Bye bye. Thank you, Rafa. Thank you so much.